very much. It's a real honor to be here. It's a pleasure. Today we're going to be talking about habit-forming technologies, because if there is one thing that we all know about the gadgets and the products that we use every single day, is that they can have a profound impact on our day-to-day -day behaviors. And so what I've done over the past several years is to look at these companies that follow some similar patterns. And I want you to see if you know any companies that fit this description. These are companies that start off as toys, as these nice to have. Maybe they have what you thought was features of somebody else's product. And in the span of a few short years, maybe five to 10 years, they're touching hundreds of millions of people's lives, if not billions of people's lives. And they're making hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in revenue. Who am I talking about? Let me hear it. Who am I talking about? Facebook, right, the $200 billion behemoth. The first time you saw Facebook, did you really think it would be as massive as it is today, touching one in every eight people on the planet? Who else? What else comes to mind? Twitter, Twitter of course. They had a huge IPO this year. Who else? Snapchat. WhatsApp, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, right? All these companies that seemingly change people's day-to-day -day behaviors so profoundly and yet so quickly. And so what, I'm, what I've done over the past several years is to look at what do we find in common with these companies? What are the patterns behind how these products become so habit-forming? Now, just so that we're all on the same page about what a habit is, a habit can be defined as a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. Thank you to Kathy Sierra for mentioning earlier about the power of habit and how we can reduce some of the cognitive burden of figuring out what to do by forming these habits. These habits, it turns out, studies have shown, account for about 40% of what we do day in and day out in our day-to-day -day lives is driven primarily from habit, these behaviors done with little or no conscious thought. And so what I believe is that we are on the precipice of an age where we can use habits for good, and I'm not alone. There's an explosion of companies today who are using the psychology behind how habits are formed to help people live happier, healthier, more productive, more connected lives by tapping into the psychology of designing for habit. And so that's what I want to help you all do today. Now, the pattern that, that I've kind of uh, discovered here or worked through is called the hook model. And I'm going to walk you through the basis of this hook model and how we find these hooks repeated time and time again in all sorts of habit-forming products. One disclaimer, though, I have to, I have to apologize because uh, normally I teach this context, uh, th this content in, the, in, the, in a three-week course at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and uh, I, I wrote this book that's about 250 pages, and I have about 30 minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to condense a lot of content and go through that pretty quickly because I, I wanted to pass on uh, as much of my research as I could as possible. So what we find inside these habit-forming products, repeated time and time again, are these hooks. These experiences designed to connect your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. Connecting your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. And we find these four basic steps of these hooks within all sorts of habit-forming experiences, online and offline. It starts with a trigger, an action, a reward, and then an investment. And you can see there's kind of this infinite loop here. So let's work through these four distinct parts of the hook. Starts off with a trigger. A trigger is a cue. It's a call to action. It's something that gets the user to take the key behavior, the key habit, by, by giving them this, this trigger. And these triggers come in two types, two flavors, if you will. We have our external triggers, and we have our internal triggers. Now, external triggers you'll be very familiar with. Right? We as product designers, we know all about these external triggers. These are things in our environment which tell us what to do next, which give us the context for what to do next, where the information for what to do is contained within the trigger itself. So any kind of call to action button like click here or buy now or play this, even in the, in the physical world, a, a police officer telling you which way to go in traffic, or a friend telling you about this great new app they, they tried out, all of these are external triggers. They tell the user what to do next by giving them some piece of information. So we know all about these external triggers. This is our craft. However, what I think product people don't think about enough 
And yet what turns out to be absolutely critical in forming these long-term habits are the internal triggers. Internal triggers are things that cue the user to action just as reliably as those external triggers. But the information for what to do next is not contained in the trigger itself. It's not in the environment, but in fact is informed through an association in the user's mind. So what we do in response to certain situations, places, routines, people, and most frequently at the top there, emotions, dictates what we do next, dictates the solutions we look for, which are often these devices or these, these technologies, which many times are in our pockets. Now, it turns out the most frequent internal triggers are at the top here, these emotions. And not just any emotion. I'm referencing a particular type of emotion. I'm referencing negative emotion. Negative emotions, so what we do when we're feeling lonesome or bored or indecisive or lost or fatigued or fearful, what we do in response to these negative emotions oftentimes dictates the technologies we turn to. Some of the research that shows this is the case comes to us from a study that showed that people with depression check email more. Now let's think about this for a minute. Why would people with depression check email more? I actually gave this workshop at a, at a company a few weeks ago and somebody stood up in the back of the room and said it's because email makes us depressed, which uh, actually was not what this research discovered, but sometimes I do feel depressed looking at my inbox. What this research uncovered was that people who suffer from clinical depression experience what psychologists call negative valence states more frequently than the general population. They feel down more often than the general population. And what were they doing to lift their mood, to get out of those negative valence states? They were checking their email. They were turning to technologies to boost their mood. And let's think about this in our own life. What technology do people use when they're feeling lonely? What do we use? Facebook, of course. And what about when we're unsure about pretty much anything? Before we actually scan our minds, what do we do? We search Google, of course. And what about when we're feeling bored? You know, between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there's that big project I don't feel like finishing. What do we do? We go into Candy Crush or YouTube or Pinterest or we go check the news or stock prices or sports scores. Lots of things cater to this internal trigger of boredom. Lots and lots of solutions to take us out of that negative valence state. And as was mentioned earlier in an earlier presentation, how we form those patterns about what provides relief dictates the habits we form. So what does this mean for us as product designers? Well, it means that fundamentally we have to understand the user's itch. From an emotional level, if we're trying to create habit-forming experiences, products that bring people back unprompted, we have to understand the user's internal triggers. Uh, there's a lot more about this in my book, but unfortunately I don't have enough time to go into how we discover those internal triggers. So I'm going to move on to the next step of the hook model. After we've discovered the user's itch, after we know the internal trigger and we use external triggers to prompt the next action, Next comes the action phase, where the user actually does the, the, the habit itself. Now, the, the action phase of the hook can be summarized as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. The simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward. Now, let me show you some examples of habit-forming products, and I want you to look at just how simple their action actually is. Something as simple as a scroll on Pinterest, or searching on Google, or pushing the play button on YouTube. These very simple behaviors done in anticipation of reward. Now it turns out that there's actually a formula for predicting these singular behaviors, these singular actions. It comes to us from a researcher at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg that posits that for any behavior B, we need three things. We need sufficient motivation, Sufficient ability, ability is how easy or difficult something is, and the trigger must be present. We just talked about triggers. So all these three elements must be present every single time, online, offline, for any human behavior to occur. Now, motivation, as defined by Edward DC, the father of self-determination theory, is the energy for action, how much we want to do a particular behavior. And of course, psychologists have been arguing about the nature of motivation for decades and decades, but Fogg gives us these six basic levers that we can use to increase people's energy for action. Because all of us, as human beings, seek pleasure and avoid pain. We seek hope and we avoid fear. We seek social acceptance and we avoid social rejection. 
So all the advertising you've seen in your life, the billboards, the television commercials, the ad copy, all of them are really targeted at using one or more of these six levers of motivation. There's a lot more to be said about motivation, but let's move on to ability. Ability is the second part of B equals MAT. It's the capacity to do a particular action. How easy or difficult something is to do. And here again, Fogg gives us these six factors that we can use to make a behavior easier to do and then more likely to occur. How much time something takes, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is required, brain cycles. Kathy talked about this earlier, how much cognitive load it takes to figure out what to do, because it turns out the harder something is to understand, the less likely the behavior is to occur. Social deviance. This has to do with the fact that we become more likely to do something when we see other people like us doing it as well. And then finally, non-routine. Non-routine dictates that the more we do something, the easier it becomes, and therefore, we become more likely to do it in the future. What do we, what do we call this? This is called practice, right? The more we do something, the easier it becomes, therefore, we become more likely to do it in the future. And this is why Habits have such a powerful repeater effect. It literally becomes easier and easier to do the action the more it becomes part of our day-to-day -day routines. So Fogg puts these three factors of motivation, ability, and triggers inside this graph. How many of you have seen this before? Oh, good. Very few. Excellent. So this is a great little tool that I think is very helpful in a product development context when you're asking yourself and you're scratching your head trying to figure out why isn't our user doing the behavior we've designed for them to do, you can plot them on this graph. You can ask yourself, does the user have sufficient motivation to take this particular behavior? Does the user have sufficient ability? If something is very hard to do, it's way over here. If something is easy to do, it's way over here. And if the user has sufficient motivation and the behavior is easy enough to do, they have sufficient ability, they cross that threshold. And if the trigger is present, the behavior will occur every time. Let's make this concrete. Think of a time when a phone rang in your life and you didn't pick up the phone. Tell me a reason you didn't pick up the phone. Just shout it out. Why didn't you pick up the phone? What's that? It, it was somebody you didn't want to talk to, I'm guessing. So your motivation was too low, even though the phone was right there next to you, and you heard it ring. The trigger was present. What's another reason you may not pick up the phone? You're eating dinner, right. So you may, you're eating dinner with your family or with a colleague, perhaps. Maybe you really wanted to pick up that call, but it's too difficult. It's too socially deviant to leave the table. It's too awkward, too much effort to take that behavior so, that, so you don't pick up the phone. What's one more reason that has to do with the trigger? Playing video games, maybe, so that might be a, a, a ability, right, if, you're, if it's too difficult to stop in the middle of that game. But what has to do with, with a trigger? Why well, you may not pick up the phone. You didn't hear it, exactly. If the phone is on vibrate and you didn't hear the call, even if your motivation was very high and the phone was right there next to you, if you didn't hear it ring, there was no trigger present. The behavior does not occur. So every single human behavior requires motivation, ability, and a trigger at the same time. Okay. So that's a very brief introduction to the action phase, now the reward phase. When it comes to rewards, we have to start in the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which was first studied by two Canadian researchers by the name of Olds and Milner. And what Olds and Milner discovered was that when they allowed lab animals and later people to stimulate this part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, they wanted nothing else. They would incessantly click on these buttons to stimulate this part of the brain over and over and over again. Many people had to have the machines forcibly removed from them to get them to stop clicking on these buttons. Well, it turns out that all sorts of things activate our nucleus accumbens each and every day. Sex, luxury goods, certain chemicals, junk food, and of course, right there in the center, technology. All of these things activate the very same neural pathways. Now, at the time, much of the psychology community believed that the purpose of the nucleus accumbens in Olds and Milner's research was that the nucleus accumbens was all about stimulating pleasure. Why else would lab animals and later people incessantly activate this part of the brain if it wasn't because it felt good, right? Well, not exactly. It turns out that the role of the nucleus accumbens is actually to stimulate the stress of desire the stress of desire, because what we now know about this part of the brain is that it becomes active 
in anticipation of a reward before we get the reward itself. But when we actually receive the thing that's supposed to make us happy, the thing that's supposed to feel good, that's when the nucleus accumbens becomes less active. Because it turns out the way our brain drives us to action is by stimulating this itch, this craving, this desire to take this particular action. And it turns out that there is a way to supercharge this stress of desire. Anybody want to know what it is? Anybody curious? Exactly. I'm doing it to you right now. Because the unknown is fascinating. So when I asked that question with a question mark at the end, and I took that long pause, and I waited for you to respond, I did something a little bit different. Right? I mixed up my cadence, and some of you kind of perked up. What's he going to do next? And it turns out that all sorts of products that have this element of variability are where we find the most engaging, the most focusing products. These are the kind of experiences that capture our attention, because it turns out that variability creates a, uh, boosts focus and engagement. And of course, much of this research comes out of the work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. Right? You know these uh, studies from your first uh, psychology courses in college. Skinner took his pigeons, put them in this little cage, he gave them a tiny disc to press on, and at first, whenever the pigeon would click on the disc, they would receive a food pellet. And, and what Skinner discovered was that basically the pigeons would click on the, on the disc whenever they were hungry. But then Skinner did something a little bit different. He added an element of variability. So sometimes the pigeon would click on the lever, nothing would come out. The next time the pigeon would click on the lever, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed is that by creating this element of variability, the rate of response, the number of times the pigeons clicked on the lever, increased. Because what we now know is that variability spikes activity in the nucleus accumbens. And in all sorts of experiences that we find the most habit-forming, the most engaging, we find one or more of these variable reward types. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. Let me introduce these to you quickly. First is rewards of the tribe, social rewards. Things that feel good, that have an element of variability, and come from other people. So the search for empathetic joy, feeling good because someone else feels good. Partnerships, cooperation, competition, all of these things have an element of variability, come from other people, and feel good. Of course, online, the best example I can think of is social media, where on a product like Facebook, when you open up your newsfeed, there's all this variability coming from your friends. What did people post? What kind of pictures might I see? What do the comments say? How many likes did I get? High degree of variability that comes in the form of this social reward. Next is the search for resources, rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt stem from our primal search for food and resources. And of course, in modern society, we buy these things with money. And when many people think about re variable rewards, they think about gambling, they think about casinos and slot machines, where, of course, the variable reward is the money that comes out of these machines. And you never know what you're going to win. Interestingly enough, we see the same exact phenomenon occur with information rewards. So when we look at, at the feed, why is it today that the feed seems to be in everything? Every product seems to have a feed. Well, why is that? Let's take a look at Twitter. OK, well, that's not very interesting. That's not very interesting. Oh, but that's interesting. And to get more, what do I have to do? To get more of these information rewards, what do I have to do? Just keep scrolling. So this becomes very similar to this, right? Just like a slot machine, these variable rewards of the hunt, searching and searching and never done searching for these rewards around information. Finally is a search for self-achievement, rewards of the self. Rewards of the self are things that feel good, that have an element of variability, but don't come from other people and aren't about these information or resource rewards. So these are intrinsic motivators. The search for mastery, consistency, competency, control, all of these things are examples of rewards of the self. So for example, in gameplay, getting to the next level, the next accomplishment would be an example of rewards of the self. And if you say to yourself, you know what, I'm not much of a game player, that, that's never been me, I bet you play this game, every day. Checking those unread messages, or clearing your to-do list, or seeing that little jewel icon on an app that you just have to check so you can clear it away, are all examples of these rewards of the self. Variable, they feel good, 
and they're all about mastery, consistency, control, competency. The point of these variable rewards is to fundamentally scratch the user's itch, to give the user what they came for, and yet leave them wanting more. And this element of variability maintains this bit of mystery about what they might find the next time they pass through the hook. The last step of the hook is the investment phase. And this is the phase of the hook that I find most frequently neglected in entrepreneurs and product managers trying to create habit-forming experiences. The investment phase is all about a future benefit. It's some bit of work that the user does, some bit of effort they put into the product in anticipation of a future reward. It's not about immediate gratification. The investment phase increases the likelihood through the hook the next time in two ways. First, investments load the next trigger. For example, when I use an app like WhatsApp, and by the way, this uh, slide was in my presentation long before the $19 billion acquisition by Facebook, but when you send a message to someone on WhatsApp, you're loading the next trigger. You're investing in the platform because when you send someone a message, even though nothing happens right there, you don't get points, you don't get badges, there's no leaderboard for sending a message, but when you send a message, you're very likely to get one of these. You're loading the next trigger because you're likely to get a reply. And that, of course, is an external trigger, which brings you back to the product and back through the hook. The second way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is by storing value. You know, one of the reasons I love working in technology products is because unlike things in the physical world, your phones and your laptops and these chairs, everything in this room, things made of atoms depreciate over time with wear and tear, right? The more we use them, the less valuable they become. But habit-forming products should do the opposite. Habit-forming technology should appreciate with use. They should get more and more valuable the more we use them. So the more content I put into iTunes, for example, the more it becomes my one and only music library. The more data I give to Mint.com, for example, a personal finance software, or Pinterest, for example, the more data I give a site like that, the better it becomes for me. It's tailored for my experience. So that if you were to log into my Pinterest account, it actually wouldn't be that interesting for you because it's been tailored based on my investment in the data I've given the company. Followers. The more followers I have, the more vi valuable the product, a product becomes, for example, like Twitter, the more followers I have, the better it becomes as a way for me to reach my audience. So that if Twitter sent out an email tomorrow and said, guess what, we're gonna start charging now to use Twitter, who's more likely to send them a check? Is it gonna be someone with 10 followers or 10,000 followers? Of course, it's gonna be the person with 10,000 followers because they've invested in the site by accruing all these followers. And then finally, reputation. Reputation is a form of stored value that users can literally take to the bank. Because on sites like Airbnb and TaskRabbit and, and eBay, your reputation literally affects what you can charge for your goods and services. And how likely am I to leave one of these platforms once I've spent all this time accruing this reputation? I've stored all this value in my reputation score. Pretty unlikely, kind of hard to leave. So that's the four steps of the hook model, very, in, very briefly in a 30,000 foot overview, a trigger, an action, a reward, and an investment. And it's through these successive cycles through the hook that user preferences are shaped, that attitudes are, are changed, and that these habits are formed. Now, whew, I told you that would be a lot, and it was. Uh, thankfully, I had this book published uh, November 4th. Uh, it's, it's available for pre-order now. There's a lot more in the book about this process and, and uh, a, a lot more real-world examples in all sorts of technology products and my blog, nearandfar.com. But this is kind of the takeaway slide, is these five fundamental questions that you can ask yourself if you're building a habit-forming experience, or maybe you already have a product that for some reason isn't bringing people back, you can ask yourself these five fundamental questions. What's the internal trigger that your product is addressing? What's the emotional itch that's occurring multiple times per day? What's the external trigger that brings the user to use the product? Number three, the action phase. What's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward? Is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more in the variable reward phase? And then finally, the investment. What's the bit of work the user puts into the product to keep them coming back, to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. So before I go, there's one more thing I'd like to mention. 
And that is, I'd like to talk about this topic of the morality of manipulation. Because let's face it, when we're designing experiences for people to take, to meet our ends, we are, in fact, participating in a form of user manipulation. And that is not something we should take lightly. That habit-forming products are a form of manipulation, and we need to be very conscious about how we use the psychology behind designing user behavior. Because the products that we're building every day are the ones that users are taking with them to bed. They're the first thing they reach for in the morning before they even say hello to their loved ones. And as Ian Bogo said, our technologies are quite possibly becoming the cigarettes of this century. So what responsibility do we have as product designers, as engineers, as investors? How do we use this psychology of behavior design for good? And how do we use it responsibly? Well, I encourage you to find one of the world's problems to fix. You know, I think that we can help people live happier, healthier, more connected, better lives by using the psychology of habit design. And that's what I want to see you do. And so I encourage you to find one of these meaningful problems to find a problem to fix, and in the words of, to borrow from the words of Gandhi, I encourage you to build the change that you wish to see in the world. Thank you very much.